And now, about today's webinar, we've put together an exceptional panel of experts to address the topic of dating in a digital age. Moderators are my colleague uh, Ro Bulo and Dr. Elena Schlachta from the National Domestic Violence Prevention Hotline. Ro Bulo is a public health professional and award-winning expert in campus sexual assault prevention with over 10 years of experience in higher education. In his role as Vice President of Prevention Education at EverFi, Rob oversees prevention research and thought leadership while also contributing to the ongoing development of EverFi's leading online prevention platforms. He has received state and national recognition for his work as prevention educator, including the 2009 Outstanding Prevention Educator Award from the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Dr. Elena Schlachta completed her Master of Education and PhD in Human Sexuality Education from Widener University. Elena is currently the Training Director at the National Domestic Violence Hotline, where she developed the hotline's 60-hour domestic violence advocacy training program and facilitates training on healthy relationships, intimate partner violence, and culturally responsive education to over 300 people annually. A highly proficient public speaker, writer, and project director, Elena has nearly 10 years of experience in training management, event planning, and program assessment. Now, after this introduction, without further ado, I'd like to kick it off uh, to Rob Bulo, who's gonna start us off today. Take it away, Rob. Thanks so much, Michaela, and thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, just a very brief introduction. We're so happy to be here. I'm certainly honored to be co-presenting with Elena as part of EverFi's partnership with the National Domestic Violence Hotline to present this webinar on addressing dating and domestic violence in the digital age as part of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we've got some great panelists that we'll introduce in just a few minutes. Um, but I would like to first turn it over to my colleague, Elena, to provide a little bit of context about Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thanks, Rob. It's so great to be here with you all. I'm not sure if it's common practice to share the number of people on the webinar, but there are um, over, well over 200 people, and it's just such a pleasure to have the opportunity to work with everyone that's on the line. So why we're doing this webinar is, as Rob mentioned, in celebration of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We are at 30 years, many of you probably know that, some of you maybe don't, of um, really recognizing um, those who have died as a result of experiencing intimate partner violence, and also celebrating those who have survived intimate partner violence. And also part of the Domestic Violence Awareness Month and part of the reason we're gathering you all today is as a result of connection. Part of the work of Domestic Violence Awareness Month is connecting all of those that work to end domestic violence and sexual assault. And so again, thank you for being here with us. Um, and in honor of um, this month, we decided to focus our time together on the element of connection. And so as Rob mentioned, um, the hotline and EverFi have a partnership where um, we are working in our own way, both in a prevention and response effort to uh, support those who are navigating into partner violence and to prevent those who haven't experienced it um, from ever having to navigate that situation. So that's one of the pieces of the connection we're celebrating for our time today. We also wanted to really emphasize um, both prevention and response. Um, here at the hotline, we work um, pretty much exclusively on the response space, helping those who are currently in abusive situations. But we recognize that that's not the only way to end domestic violence in our world. A big part of that is prevention. So a big focus of our time today is how do you integrate prevention and response? Um, and we have some fantastic panelists who will be uh, talking through some, some great points around that specifically around domestic violence in the digital age. So before Rob gives you more detail about the prevention work that EverFi is doing, I wanted to give you all some statistics to really set the stage for why we have focused this one hour of our time together on domestic violence in the digital age, or you could even call it just domestic or, uh, digital abuse in general. So these statistics, 
come from a study that we did here at the hotline in 2011. And of course, 2011 is basically light years ago, um, thinking about all the advances in technology that we see today. Um, but it's still interesting, some of the findings that we saw in 2011, and I know that they're relevant today. And the first one is just that one in four dating teens experience what we call digital abuse, which is being harassed online or through constant bombardment of text messages, phone calls, and so social media connections. So of course, this isn't new to any of you. The next one talks about, um, Rob, if you can progress, there we go, um, that one in three dating college students. So we saw one in four teens. We see here that one in three dating college students um, has given a partner their computer, email, or social network passwords. And that what's interesting about this statistic is that those who do share passwords or share access to technology um, are more likely to experience digital abuse. Not surprising, um, but interesting that that was a, a finding um, so many years ago. And then in our next statistic, that this one, again, I find so interesting that we may think that digital abuse or manipulation with technology exists in a vacuum, but in reality, um, only 4% of young people in our study shared with us that they were only experiencing digital abuse or harassment online. In fact, the other 96% of people who were experiencing dating abuse said that the social media, the text messages, those weren't new tools to manipulate and to maintain power and control in a relationship. They were just another tool um, among many that were being used by an abusive partner. And I think we have one more statistic here. And that one um, really highlights that um, the connection between digital abuse and other forms of abuse. That essentially we see that people who experience um, digital abuse and harassment online or with any other form of technology are really more likely to also in the future um, within that same relationship be exposed to some type of physical abuse, um, other types of emotional or psychological abuse, and to also potentially experience um, sexual coercion. And that we see the relationship between uh, digital abuse and being more likely to experience sexual coercion, that was the biggest connection. And I wanted to leave us with this particular statistic because it really highlights that the experience of digital abuse is what we could call a warning sign um, for potentially in the future, someone experiencing other more dangerous, um, more physically affected types of abuse. And so it's also interesting in the sense that if we see someone experiencing digital abuse, if we intervene by getting curious, by asking questions, by expressing our concern, that we may be able to prevent some of those more escalated forms of violence from ever happening. Um, and so again, trying to integrate the prevention and the response um, with some of these statistics. So Rob, I know you have a lot more to share about kind of what you all are doing um, in this space. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Elena. And you know, as a technology company that supports over 1,700 colleges and universities across the country, I wanted to just briefly share a few insights from our data and some of the approaches that we use to address sexual and relationship violence. And certainly while our course development is very much steeped in research and known best practice, these are just a few examples of possible options and strategies for leveraging technology to prevent and respond to these issues. So the first point that I wanted to share and some additional statistics, it, uh, it's incredible. The overwhelming majority of college students, staff, and faculty have incredibly healthy attitudes and behaviors related to these issues. So you can see a few incredibly positive statistics um, from our fall 2016 survey data of about over 600,000 incoming college students saying that they would reach out to offer support to a friend that they think is in an abusive relationship and would express concern if they saw someone exhibiting abusive behavior towards a partner. And so I, I think that this really has implications around shifting our message, not so much on preventing bad behaviors, but really promoting and empowering students to engage in the healthy behaviors that they already want to be engaging in. So I have a few examples in this screen here from our brand new launch sexual assault prevention ongoing education course. And we start that course not by defining sexual assault and relationship violence, but really having students identify their values because those values are a foundation for their personal 
personal engagement in prevention work. And we go on to also talk about um, their expectations around healthy relationships, what makes a good relationship and what do they want to get out of relationships of any kind. And then lastly, uh, to ensure that we're continuing to build on prior content as this course is intended to be for continuing students that have already participated in our primary education program, we build on that by actually talking about new content areas that might be more appropriate for older students on campus. So thinking about things like healthy breakups. And I know one of our panelists is doing a lot of great work in that realm. And then a, a few other things I'll point out just around best practices for technology is certainly accessibility. And so ensuring that the courses can be accessed um, by learners of all level, levels of ability, as well as diversity of images and representation in those trainings. So we might be wondering if everyone's healthy on campus, why do these problems still exist? And, and I think that part of that is simply a misperception of social norms on campus, um, where we see that in this data point from one of our courses, 84% of students say that they would take action if they saw someone potentially being taken advantage of sexually. But only 53% of them felt that others at their school would take action in that situation. And so that misperception or discrepancy around social norms can create real barriers for students engaging in healthy behaviors if they don't feel that those behaviors are cool or common or acceptable or would be supported by their peers. So bystander intervention as we're all very familiar with, I'm sure, it's, it's all about engaging and empowering that healthy majority of students and employees at our school to create the kind of community that they want to live and learn and work in. But it's important when we do that to not fall into the trap of framing bystander intervention simply as see something, say something. Because what, what something are we trying to get them to see? And what something are we trying to get them to do? Because students are often able to recognize acutely violent or abusive behaviors, but how are we teaching them to identify more subtle actions or language that contribute to violence and abuse? So when we provide skill building scenarios, we're walking through sort of an escalation of violence and abusive behaviors. And here is one example of specifically honing in on digital abuse. And it's really important that students recognize that behavior where a person's at a study group and she's getting texted nonstop by her partner saying, you know, where are you at? Who are you with? Um, and as Elena talked about, digital abuse is absolutely connected to more escalated forms of psychological, physical, and sexual violence. But then going beyond just having students be able to identify problem situations, it's really important that they can identify and overcome barriers. So recognizing the real or perceived barriers that learners face, it's important to also validate those challenges that they're feeling while providing new perspectives and considerations to help overcome those barriers. And then absolutely giving a diverse set of strategies to ultimately create a toolkit of options for students, depending on the unique styles and strengths of the individual, as well as the unique dynamics of the situations that they might find themselves in. And then lastly, we've talked a lot about sort of upstream, more primary prevention strategies. There's also opportunities to integrate secondary and tertiary prevention approaches in technology as well. So here's a screenshot of one of our learning platforms around sexual violence prevention. And I wanted to just share two features so one is a live chat with an advocate feature, which is part of our partnership with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Students who need support while they're going through the course have the option of clicking this if their school has activated this feature and being connected, leaving the EverFi platform, going on to the National Domestic Violence live chat platform and being connected with a trained advocate who can help them to address whatever situations they might be feeling in the moment as they're going through the courses. But then we also know it's important to provide students with an option to quickly get out of these courses if they're already in an abusive relationship where it might be unsafe if their partner sees them going through these courses. We certainly want to be mindful of that in our courses as well. And certainly by way of uh, uptake of this chat with an advocate feature, we're really incredibly pleased that 
408 students just through June uh, to August of this year have used that live chat with an advocate feature during their participation in EverFi's online sexual violence prevention trainings. Um, and these are students that needed support and received it in real time, where we know if, if they weren't necessarily able to get that support in real time, we don't know if they would have been able to come forward otherwise and get support. So we're really incredibly happy about this feature and looking forward to this continued partnership with the hotline. So with that, I now want to transition us to the bulk of today's webinar, which is our panel discussion. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing panelists. Um, we are fortunate to be joined by Jess Alder. Jess Alder is the program manager of the Start Strong Building Healthy Teen Relationship Initiative at the Boston Public Health Commission. She holds her master's in public administration from Suffolk University. For four years, Jess was an educator, advocate, and consultant for rape crisis centers in Denver and Boston. She's been working in the field of teen dating violence prevention for the past six years, and has two decades of experience working with young people as an educator, coach, and mentor. Uh, she's conducted local and national workshops on a variety of issues, and we're incredibly happy to have Jess with us today. Then we are joined by Tyrena Heck, uh, Prevention Coordinator with the Texas Council on Family Violence. Tyrena received a Bachelor's in Sociology from the University of Texas at Austin and worked as a Sexual Assault Prevention Specialist at the Williamson County Crisis Center. Her passion is supporting youth leaders in the movement to end violence and encouraging adult allies to partner with young people. Tyrena is currently working with the Texas Council's Youth Board to establish safe, youth-led social media platforms that raise awareness for teen dating violence. Tyrena, thanks so much. A pleasure to have you joining us. And then lastly, Sarah Colome. As a director of the Women's Resource Center at the University of Illinois' Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations, Sarah is responsible for improving the campus climate for women and developing and implementing programs that address women's issues and gender-related concerns. Prior to her work at the university, she served as the manager of Break the Cycle's capacity building program, where she designed and implemented innovative training and technical assistance projects, focusing on preventing and addressing gender-based violence. In addition to collaborating with a variety of partners, including ABC Family, Georgetown University, Mary Kay, National Sororities, and others, Sarah managed three technical assistance projects supporting grantees of the Department of Justice's Office on Violence Against Women. With her background in education and advocacy, Sarah brings a passion for intersectional social justice to each aspect of her work. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us and to all of our panelists. So with that, I want to now turn it over to our panelists for our first question. And we'll start with Jess um, with this first question, which is when it comes to relationship violence, what are some emerging challenges that you see around how technology is being used by students and staff and faculty on campuses? Awesome. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining. It's really fun to be on a webinar. Um, so I'm going to repeat this a lot, but media is a tool that can be used to hurt or heal. So technology isn't just pure evil. Um, and while we are talking about college age students, I want to emphasize that these behaviors start earlier than college and they're strongly embedded in our culture. Uh, how men um, use media versus how women use media can vary, including other communities um, of color and LGBTQ. So those factors are going to be different and unique per group. Um, but for two things uh, that are kind of how technology is kind of being used in a mean way. Um, I want to focus on two areas. So one is something called Finstagram, which um, is essentially creating a fake profile. So that name is specific to Instagram. Um, but keep in mind that all social media platforms can be used to create a fake profile. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> um, if a, a young person recently that I work with, somebody created a fake Tinder account for her, um, and put her social media handles, uh, which is um, her screen name, so people could find her. Uh, and they shared her Snapchat. So she started to receive a lot of followers um, that, that could access her site and see what was going on. Um, and we, when, you, when you realize that you can be tracked a little bit more easily than that, that can, that can prove to be pretty harmful and damaging. Um, another story is one of uh, my young people had a fake Facebook page created about her, um, and the people that were running the site ended up uh, 
threatening other people. So it, it led to her feeling really unsafe at school and increased some safety concerns even outside of school and in her neighborhood. Um, and these stories can be, you know, amplified when societal society normalizes these behaviors and they write it off as boys will be boys or she let them on, et cetera. Um, technology uh, is an instrument that concentrates these norms in a very public space. So it can take private moments and make it public. Uh, and the other example is with sexting. So sexting is essentially sending naked or explicit text messages. And the laws haven't really caught up with this technology, um, especially with revenge porn. So that means if somebody is upset, um, say after a breakup or when feelings can be really charged, um, they don't really have laws around that. There are laws around um, child pornography, so anyone under the age of 18. So if you're under the age of 18 and you receive um, a picture of somebody that could fall under child pornography, or um, if even that message is, message is forwarded to you. Um, so it can get really tricky and the laws are really nebulous at the moment. And so a, a judge could easily uh, pin something on you to set an example, which wouldn't, wouldn't really be helpful. So wanting to get on top of that is important. And that's, that's it. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, Tyrena, what, what sorts of challenges are you seeing around uh, the use of technology by students, staff, and faculty on campuses? Absolutely. So I've been working with young people for a number of years now, specifically doing prevention education with them. And so many different things would come up when we would have conversations or, you know, uh, just as my time progressed in the program. And a couple of things that I noticed as far as challenges was one, just the cyber harassment with students and bullying on social media. So to follow up with some of the things that Jess was mentioning, you know, creating those fake pages um, just that are deliberately designed to, humi to humiliate people. So using a person's image um, to create a page only to make fun of them um, and to harass folks. Also, you know, I had um, one of my students talk about the exposed pages that happen at high schools and on different campuses and college campuses where uh, a group of young people will create this page and will literally upload any pictures, um, any inappropriate pictures of other young people onto one page for everybody to go see. And they'll typically call this something as far as, um, you know, the exposed page of whatever high school or college campus it may be. And the issue with that is that these pages usually are up for a while until, and it takes a long time for them to get shut down. So people's personal information, um, pictures that they don't want to be seen are, are up for the world. And it, it's embarrassing and it's also humiliating. Um, also, you know, just catfishing. Just someone just trying to pretend to be someone else that they're not by using Facebook or by using a social media platform um, to be, basically create a false sense of identity to um, pursue some type of online romances with other people. And that becomes a bigger issue because now people are within these relationships for a year or two or several months and they've invested time into someone who is not actually who they say they are. Um, and that becomes very challenging. In, in addition to that, you have group forums and comment boxes and some of the negative and nasty comments that can be left in these boxes. Um, you know, a lot of people, they tend to troll if it's like a group forum and someone's talking about, oh, you know, here's, here's a video I posted today or here's an issue that I, I would love to address. Well, then, of course, you have trolls that will sometimes come in um, and deliberately just make offensive comments. Um, just to aim at upsetting people or, or to get an angry response out of people, you know, and it's very, it's very interesting when we think about all of these different things that can happen on campus and, and young people experiencing them every single day. Uh, I, I know I've done a lot of research, especially looking into do something.org. Uh, they're very interesting with helping young people lead initiatives and campaigns, but they say that 81% of young people think that bullying online is actually easier to get away with than bullying in person. So a lot of times when you have these situations where someone is trolling, um, it's, the, it's because the accountability factor is missing within it. It's because, you know, people will say things online that they wouldn't t uh, tend to say in person. 
So it's figuring out, you know, how do we do something about that or how do we hold others accountable for their actions? Also, you know, over 80% of teens, they use a cell phone regularly, regularly, making it the most common medium for cyberbullying. So when we're talking about online, you know, it's not necessarily just happening at a desktop or someone's laptop, but it's, it's such easy access uh, from being able to use your phone that does all sorts of things. So these are by far some of the biggest challenges that I've seen, particularly with students. But when it comes to employees and faculty and adults, you know, um, one of the challenges I also see is just either the lack of awareness of what's happening or the lack of um, prioritizing this issue because it's happening online or because it's happening on social media. You know, sometimes employees will know that it's happening and they'll see it. Um, but if it's not necessarily a crisis or if it isn't urgent and you know it's and it's harder to 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 be tangible um sometimes it's it's not prioritized um as much as something bigger that's happening on campus even though this is a big issue and a big thing um so yeah those are a couple of the things that i notice in regards to the challenges Thanks, Tyrena. It's really interesting to think about, you know, on the employee side, uh, certainly the barriers around when this isn't seen as central to their job functions um, and it not being prioritized in that way, uh, not having the tools and skills to be able to intervene. And then certainly the, the cloak of anonymity that social media provides for otherwise unacceptable behavior, cyberbullying, cyberstalking, cyber harassment. Um, thank you. And, and Sarah, can you close us out on this topic and provide some perspectives from where you sit around emerging technology challenges. Absolutely, and um, I'll echo uh, my other fellow panelists and saying thank you so much for having me here. Um, they both make great points. Just to add a few other things building off what's been shared, um, I think one of the real ways in which we're seeing challenges is this normalization of technological abuse, which um, both of the other panelists have talked about. But when we talk to young people, and even adults in many cases, we've really been conditioned to consider things like excessive texting or GPS tracking as something that's rooted in a concern for someone else's safety. Um, so when a partner says, oh, I just want to know where you are at all times so I know that you're safe, or the part there's the partner who's constantly check in, checking in with where, where are you, when are you going to be done, why aren't you answering, um, what are you doing that's more important than me? Media and our culture tell us that jealousy and control are a sign of love when we know that these are actually examples of unhealthy and even in some cases abusive relationship behaviors. So I think we're up, we're facing a challenge in shifting that um, socialized, socialized narrative so that we can really start looking at these actions um, as problematic. And building off something that Jess mentioned, uh, legislation has not caught up to our technological reality. And the same goes for campus policy. So while requirements exist around campuses need to have sexual misconduct, dating abuse, domestic violence, and stalking policies, in some cases, these policies are not inclusive of the technological methods that people use to perpetrate abuse. Um, I'm lucky to be on a campus where we think about that, but that's not the case in a lot of places. And this is particularly more challenging as technology is rapidly moving and changing. And what might be a popular platform last month isn't even on young people's radars this month. So keeping our campus policies as well as state and federal policy in place so that people truly are protected and have avenues for remedies is something that I see as an ongoing challenge that we will see um, as long as technology is a reality in our lives. The last thing is um, really rooted in my last point, which is that the, the emerging challenge that I have seen the most while on campus, while my time at Break the Cycle working with grantees across the country is a fundamental misunderstanding of technology that's rooted in fear. Um, for those who may not use, to use technology or social media on a frequent basis, there's an assumption that it's not a useful tool or too cumbersome to learn about or worse that it can only lead to negativity. So I'll often hear adults say that social media, for example, is too easy to manipulate as a tool for abuse for us to consider using it for prevention or engagement methods. But it's important to remember that anything can, that can be manipulated also has the potential for being helpful um, and that the potential for something to be harmful doesn't reduce its potential for being helpful. So technology is an incredible tool for us to use to both engage and learn from young people, 
though it does require us overcoming our fear and recognizing that we don't know everything, which is ultimately rooted in the necessity to overcome any of these challenges, which is working alongside young people. That's great, Sarah. This is a, this has been a wonderful introduction, uh, certainly to some of the micro individual level behaviors um, that technology is allowing to to happen, and certainly facilitating macro level factors around uh, evolving legislation or slow to evolve legislation and policies and the changes in the technology landscape, even the vernacular of Instagram, catfishing, sexting, revenge, revenge porn, trolling. Um, and, and I think that you set up a, a, a really great transition, Sarah, to our next question around, well, if those are the challenges, how are we actually seeing campuses use technology to improve the scope and impact of their prevention and response initiatives? And so, Tyrena, if you could start us off in terms of uh, how technology is paving a path forward. Absolutely. And, you know, starting this off, I have to follow what um, Sarah just said, because it is so true. It, it's the fear around technology, which is the reason why, you know, people try to steer clear away from it. But the reason why, why campuses are starting to, or, or what are some reasons behind them improving their prevention efforts is actually by utilizing social media and by utilizing technology. Um, some of the biggest things I've seen campus doing, uh, campuses achieving is you know using social media to initiate a campaign or movement and to ultimately create change on campus um, so for instance i was working with this group out in williamson county texas and they wanted everyone in their town just to have respect for each other they wanted adults to respect young people and vice versa they wanted uh, young people to have respects um, respect for adults and so they were like you know what could we do or what's something that we could accomplish together in order to get our message out there fast. And so they decided coming up with three different platforms and using them to, to spread a campaign. And they were using Facebook, they were using YouTube, um, and also Twitter to really push this message out to their community about respect. Now, initially it started off as, oh, you know, this is respect campaign, it's just gonna be online, it's no big deal, we'll make a couple of posts a week, and that's it. But because their campaign grew and it got bigger and bigger, they were actually able to um, host an event and, and raise a bunch of money from this campaign that started online. So really that for the prevention efforts, they can, if we utilize social media, you know, it can really open up uh, a door for bigger things to happen. Um, also, making sure to involve campus amb ambassadors to operate technology and to also promote these initiatives. One of the coolest things I see campuses doing, you know, if they have a, a Snapchat, it's not just a director or, or some faculty running their Snapchat, but it's a young person. It's a student who's on that campus. You know, they've worked with them to develop content. They've worked with them to develop what's the message that we want to get out to everyone. But in the end, they're ultimately the one who's operating the technology. And because of that, um, they have a better understanding of their school's needs and actually the messages people want to hear and how they want to hear it. And so just working with a campus ambassador to operate technology and promote initiatives, that's been one of the biggest things that I've seen, um, including just using the really awesome tools on Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook, all of these other things. By, by being able to get the entire community involved and create like geo filters, um, through Snapchat, also creating a community story specific to a campus, you know, it, it really promotes that sense of connection and, and makes people want to take an initiative um, in order to prevent these issues from happening with, within their campus. That's great. So leveraging the speed and viral nature of technology, particularly social media, um, you know, allowing the people who really have their finger on the pulse of emerging technology, which is our students, uh, really be in the driver's seat of, of owning our, our technology footprint. Um, that's wonderful. Sarah, can you weigh in on this question around improving the scope and impact of prevention and response through technology? I'd love to. And Tyrena makes um, several great points. So what I will say is that there are very exciting things happening across the country that can be used as catalyzing platforms for real social change. Um, I'll just give a couple of examples of places that I know have done this. Um, I'm a big fan of highlighting those that are doing work well. And I'll also say that um, 
it's okay to reach out and ask for help. Um, these people are more than happy oftentimes to share their insights on what worked and what didn't work. So some of the things that come to mind that I've seen um, would be uh, the, the use around like social norming media campaigns. Um, and this is something that's really rooted out of social norm theory uh, and shifting the perceived reality to an actual reality. So it's been used a lot on campuses around drug and alcohol prevention and awareness, but there are also places that are doing it um, for prevention and awareness building around gender-based violence and that have done it well. So some of the folks that come to mind, um, I was working with Project Pays out of Denver, Colorado, uh, and they were partnering with an organization called the Conflict Center. And together they were working in local high schools to um, survey students in the hallways. And then what was really cool is they would take the data that they got from these surveys, sit down with the students and say, all right, what's the most impactful um, research that's coming out of this? What makes you go, oh, I wouldn't have thought that. That's not what I thought my fellow peers were saying, thinking, or doing. And then they work with them to select the statistics that would be posted. And they also work with them on poster design, um, engagement materials, so that they knew what they were creating was really rooted in and relevant to the young people that they're trying, they were trying to work with. I see no reason why this couldn't be done then on a digital platform as well. Um, another resource that I know that would, is great for that is the National Social Norms Resource Center. And this has been done in some places already. So. Um, I've seen it done at the at Sacred Heart University, the University of Albany, um, even in some Berkeley area high schools, and the Rape Abuse Incest National Network even did one around sexual violence. So those social norm media campaigns, I think, really gets to that more macro level of change that we really struggle with um, measuring and seeing how we're actualizing change in those ways. And it can be done in a very subtle manner or it can be done in a really direct manner. Some of the other ways that I've seen things done, um, I'll use a couple examples from the last organization I was at, which is Break the Cycle. Uh, we were fortunate enough to partner with Alpha Chi Omega's uh, national leadership around um, putting together a train the trainer on consent so that chapter leaders were trained on what does consent look like? How do we have these conversations in our chapters? How do we build the capacity of our sisters to be both change makers on campus, but also offer support to our peers when they're experiencing instances of um, sexual violence or dating abuse. And so what we did, because we needed to reach chapters all across the nation, is we did a video training with um, a couple additional components so that we could make up for the fact that we couldn't be in person with everyone. So it was a visual training that was followed up with uh, call-in office hours. Um, at a variety of times and dates so that if somebody couldn't make one because they had class, they might be able to make another. And then we followed up with some engagement tips and tools and ways that the students could use social media to push out both awareness building information um, and also sharing resources for those who may need um, response services and support. Um, there's also things like at a, at a really minute level, just shifting the ways in which we're sharing information. So Break the Cycle just released their password consent campaign, which is kind of their back to school thing this year. And um, something, we have a fantastic social media person, we say have a fantastic social media person there, um, who encourage us to think about how we're putting out statistics. So in this toolkit, what we did is, rather than having just the bullet points of statistics that's pulled from research, we took the stats and we, we framed them in a way that they were tweetable. Almost everything that's on that page um, is 140 characters or less and has strategic hashtags and links so that all somebody would have to do is copy it and they can send it out through their social media. They wouldn't have to think about how to pare down a really complex or um, really long piece of research. And so that's another way that's just a small shift. Maybe you aren't ready to do a giant campaign, but even those little things um, are ways that we can start to make change. The last thing I wanna highlight is um, coalition building, and this can be done in a variety of ways. So there's really formal ways. Break the Cycle has Let's Be Real, which is a national coalition for young people who are trying to create change and then go actualize it in their own communities. But even the coalition building that happens in community building that occurs from things like Twitter chats and Twitter town halls and other events where there might be somebody who's really, really passionate 
about um, prevention in Rantoul, Indiana, which is not a large community, and they're not able to get to Chicago and, and really meet folks and get involved in things on the ground and in person. But when they're involved in a Twitter chat um, with people in Chicago, in Austin, in Los Angeles, and even other rural communities, they're building a network of change makers one, so that they are learning from those people, but two, they're potentially creating allies for further change-making events down the line and people that they can lean on for support. So there's a lot of avenues that people can be using, whether through programming, whether through awareness, or even just student development um, that have a lot of potential that campuses and schools can be using. Sarah, I, I think that you have probably signed yourself up to uh, provide a, a list of some of those resources that you just named, as I'm sure folks are uh, quickly trying to jot them down. Um, but thank you, that's incredibly helpful. And so Jess, I, I, I would love to hear your perspective on this question, just given you've spent the last six years in the most higher education dense area in the country here in Boston. Uh, what are you seeing from your perspective? <laughs> Yes, we have 60 colleges just in Boston, which is really overwhelming, um, especially on move-in day. So something that I want to highlight, I mean, and it echoes Sarah's point of capitalizing on existing resources that exist um, within, the, within the communities, because that can eliminate the silos that are happening and creating a win-win situation. Um, Sorry, we live in cubicle land. Um, the other thing is that students are going to be the greatest resources themselves. Um, they know what's going on. They have a wealth of knowledge that the universities can capitalize on. Um, and also joining other social movements that exist, um, like One Loves That's Not Love campaign, um, where conversations have already started and um, you can build off of some already existing platforms. Um, campuses are in a pretty unique position to instill social change in their environment. Um, and so really digging in and understanding where these messages are coming from, what norms are being enc encouraged, and how these behaviors are supported is a really good step. Um, oftentimes these behaviors, when technology is being used as a tool to hurt, um, are amplified when someone feels uh, a loss of control, so during a breakup. Uh, is an example and start strong hosts uh, breakup summit to specifically start talking about those issues and we invite college students and adults um, so that they can learn how to support their friends and the people that they work with um, when undergoing um, unhealthy breakups um, so tools that we encourage are having programs where you can anonymously dial in or email um, ask for help with your ra or other um, campus groups that are available um, and you I think emphasizing especially if we want to change the norm is to start the conversations and critically examining these mediums and how they can be used to help or hurt um, start strong also has a couple of tools that people can turn to social media situationships is a tool that's used to unpack uh, healthy or unhealthy communication styles that can be illustrated on Twitter. So if somebody's airing someone's past behavior um, or, or bringing up past hurts, um, name calling, et cetera, helping them understand and unpack um, the detriment and impact it can have on somebody, um, especially when we see celebrities and other people that are in the spotlight really uh, showcasing these unhealthy behaviors, they can be normalized a little bit more. Uh, and with that, um, we have another tool called the Real Binary Tool, which helps unpack the gender norms that are presented when people start to uh, police certain behaviors and, and say whether or not someone can or can't do something um, based on their gender identity. Uh, and the last tool that we have that I think would be really helpful, um, it's called Supporting Your Teen. And while it was made for high school students, it can be repurposed for an older audience. Essentially, the tool just places an emphasis uh, on the three E's, which is empathizing, educating, and empowering somebody. So really getting the whole community, the whole campus involved in understanding uh, how, how media can be used um, and how they can, how, the, how, how, how they can educate around dismantling these norms and empower people to try to make some different choices similar to what 
um, the, the program in Denver is doing of asking them to just uh, re rethink uh, some of the behaviors that people do. Thanks so much, Jess. Uh, some more great resources, certainly continued reference to social norms, critically examining the digital landscape that our students and our employees live their lives in. Thanks so much for that perspective. So uh, panelists, our, our last question is around recommendations. So we've got a lot of folks on the line um, who work on college campuses and are thinking about technology uh, from a prevention and a response perspective. And we know that the landscape of available options continues to grow and change over time. So what recommendations do you have for administrators uh, when it comes to selecting and implementing technology to address these critical issues? So um, for sake of time, if we could just have a, a couple minute responses from, from each panelist, starting first with Sarah. Absolutely. A lot of what I was going to say has been shared, so I won't repeat those. Um, one of the things I would love to stress is don't reinvent the wheel, but do root yourself in your community. So what works for, say, El Dorado High School in Placentia, California may not be the most relatable or even relevant for Clemson University in South Carolina. But that said, the basics of how to set up a Snapchat account, for example, doesn't vary on your geographic location, assuming that internet access is available. So um, absolutely make sure that you're reaching out to people. Don't be afraid to do that. And make sure that when you are replicating something, it's rooted in the needs of your community, as several of us have said throughout this webinar. Um, accessibility is also something to be thinking about um, and how to engage difficult to reach communities. So not assuming that everybody has access to technology, but at the same time, recognizing that technology can be the tool to access difficult to reach communities. So considering streaming trainings, streaming lectures, streaming events, doing Twitter chats rather than round tables, um, and also thinking about the media that you're using um, when you're doing prevention and awareness building so that it's relatable to the communities that you're working with. Another thing I want to highlight is to recognize that nothing is entirely safe. So we've really stressed that um, technology can help to heal as well as hurt. But while learning about technology, it's important that we make ourselves aware of the limitations of technology, how to navigate technology, and then share that information with the communities that we're working with. So for example, when we're asking people to participate in Instagram campaigns, remind them to turn off their geolocator. And then the last thing I'd share is just learn about it and don't be afraid of it. Work alongside students and embrace their expertise. Both of the other panelists have said this and I will just reiterate it because I think it's so important is young people are the ones who are going to be able to tell you what's hot and what's not, what's engaging and what won't work. Partnering with young people from start to finish on a project can save you a lot of potentially wasted energy and resources. So my last thought would be at the end of the day, students should be at the center of all of your efforts. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, Jess, can you close us out with some perspectives and recommendations from your end? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I think a lot of it has really been shared. Um, I think just zooming out on a more macro level is understanding the intersections of gender, race, violence, culture, et cetera, um, to really start uh, to create a foundation to change some of these unhealthy social norms is going to be instrumental in those conversations. Um, one one um, tool that we've used to start conversations with young people and adults is a web series called The Halls, which are young people created. The Halls is essentially a web series. It's like a modern day Degrassi uh, that discusses unhealthy masculinity um, and how it pertains to identity, young fatherhood, consent, and homophobia. Um, and the web series is accompanied with a discussion guide so that somebody that maybe is new to having these conversations, to someone that's more seasoned, they'll be able to walk through each conversation with salient takeaways and anticipated challenges so that they can feel really comfortable and confident when starting these conversations with people. That's really helpful. Thanks so much, Jess. And, and Tyrena, recommendations that you have for campus administrators? Absolutely. Just following um, both of what my other two panelists have said is 
you know, just really getting your young people involved. When I think about the bigger goal and the larger goal of our prevention efforts, it's to shift culture. We are specifically trying to move from a culture that accepts violence to one that promotes mutual dignity and respect. And the only way we can do that and make that happen is by getting everyone involved, not just the experts, not just adults, but our young people and making sure that we're promoting collaboration between the two. And you know, a lot of things I've shared, talking about social media, our Facebook, all of the fun things that young people can be involved in. But what about the hard things as well? So not just your social media initiatives and your campaigns, but what about your policies and your procedures and the prevention efforts you're taking, uh, you're making on a campus? How do we ensure that we are hearing the voice of young people and we're including them in that process from the beginning to the end? And I think that's something very important as well. If we're going to be making policies and procedures um, pertaining to them, we need to be including them um, in that process as well. And I know here at TCFV, specifically our prevention team, we work with uh, our, our Young Hearts Matter Youth Advisory Board so that they can inform the work and what we're doing uh, and making sure that we're hearing their voice and that their voice is heard. And some of the ways we do that is by using um, facilitation structures. For instance, we, we use a set of liberating, uh, liberating structures that really help us capture the best thinking that happens in a room. So if it's structuring how that conversation um, should happen or should take place. Uh, liberating structures is very helpful, um, and it's, it's actually a, a fun way to allow these conversations to happen. Because one last thing I would like to add is, you know, addressing these critical issues, it doesn't have to be this long, drawn out, boring process, especially when you have campuses full of young people who are innovative and who are full of life. It, you know, it's more about how do we all get in a room together and collaborate and share ideas and really capture some meaningful insight from your campus experts who are your young people? And um, you know, I think if that can get accomplished, you know, um, the prevention efforts and response efforts can go a long way and very far on any campus. That's great. So, you know, in summary, what I'm hearing is collaboration is key and absolutely keeping students central to that process. You know, I talked about accessibility and the importance of digital literacy and learning about new technologies, really immersing yourself in the landscape, absolutely being aware of risks and safety as you're doing so, and then focusing beyond just the programs that we're doing and also, you know, keeping that collaboration going when we think about our policies and our procedures as well. And so to, to bring us to a close in terms of resources, there's been a ton of great resources from our panelists and um, we'll certainly follow back up and I'll be sure to connect with our panelists and, uh, and get some of their top lists of those resources that we can share back out with folks. But I wanna turn it back to Elena to both reflect on the, the panel discussion and then share one more additional resource uh, from her perspective. So Elena, take it away. Thanks, Rob, and thanks everyone for sticking with us through the end. Um, I want to echo what Rob had summarized around this piece of collaboration. Um, it often feels like we do our work in silos, you know, whether it's within our community or in our campus or even in our department, and we feel like it's difficult to connect with others. And at the hotline, we experience that as well. And what we found is that it seems like we live in a world where there's never enough time. And I know everyone on the line can resonate with that, but it's really worth it to carve the time out, whether it's for creating vision for the future, establishing partnerships with other people who are doing similar work in similar rural, urban areas. And connection is so powerful. And sometimes I think that's the thing that gets lost in the work that we do. And you, you have to make the time to do that because as you can hear all the wonderful examples I would imagine there was a level of innovation and collaboration that made all of these case studies for programs and wonderful campaigns that are happening, that that community and collaboration is what made that possible. So that's the one thing that I would just really hit home on is we can't do this alone. And there's so much wonderful work happening out there and you're not alone and there's great people to partner with. So make sure you're making the time for that. 
the other resource that has nothing to do with collaboration, um, but is a resource that I find incredibly helpful. Um, I am going to out myself and just say, I'm not someone who's tech savvy, and yet I am very involved in creating programs and curricula. Um, and I have found that knowing what else is out there to educate myself or to point other people who are like me that aren't tech savvy and find it overwhelming, that there are some resources available to us to navigate that landscape. And this resource that you see on your screen, um, the Tech Safety Project from the National Network to End Domestic Violence is a fantastic project um, that basically gives you more content than you could probably imagine around how to keep yourself safe um, in the in the digital age, um, and whether that's personally or whether that's someone who is experiencing um, digital abuse or even as someone who's in a very physically or sexually violent relationship who may also be experiencing digital abuse, this resource is a way for you to help partner with that survivor to increase their safety. So my last note is you don't have to know it all, but you do have to know where you can go when you don't have the knowledge that you need to support someone. And this is a great resource for that in the digital space that we are operating in. Thanks so much, Elena. And, and to close things out, uh, I'd like to announce a new resource uh, from Everfi as well. And this is a guide for campus decision makers around assessing online prevention programs. And this guide really opens up with the notion that campuses should be reassessing their program options on a regular basis to ensure that as their needs and priorities change and as new products become available, that they're using the programs that best align and meet the needs of their students staff and faculty. So uh, Michaela will be sharing a link to that in the chat bar of uh, the GoToWebinar panel. You can also see a link to download this guidebook uh, in the bottom left of the screen. So you can either access that in the chat bar or in the bottom left. And we'll be following up um, on the webinar with this resource. And uh, it really outlines a number of, of critical components around making really intentional decisions around the technology that you're using, including how you select the people who review that technology, key questions to ask in priority areas uh, around the technology that you're using, um, the people that develop the content, the product development process, efficacy data on the course, um, alignment with compliance and regulatory policies, uh, data insights and access to information, service track record of the organization, and certainly ongoing support in the way that technology fits within the broader ecosystem of your prevention and response initiatives. And absolutely to the notion of the importance uh, of the student perspective in this decision-making process, a survey template to use to effectively engage students who have an incredibly important contribution and voice in this process and must be engaged in the process as well, um, but certainly should be done so within the context of, of best practice and um, certainly in collaboration with the subject matter experts who are deeply immersed in the research literature and those best practices. So we hope that folks uh, do take advantage of that resource uh, and download it. And so with that, we are, are just here at the end of our time. And so uh, I would like to uh, channel my, my connection to this technology and, and just share to our panelists and to Elena that I, I can hear a, a digital roaring round of applause for all of you and, and your contribution to this webinar and the contribution uh, that this serves as part of a really important month uh, in October, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And thank you to all of the folks who have joined us for this webinar. We will be following up with our um, a recording, the slides, and some of the resources that were shared here. And as Michaela said, we do encourage you to give your feedback for all of our great panelists. They've worked really hard putting these perspectives together for you all. And so we would love to hear your feedback on ways that this was helpful and ways that we can continue to support your work. Uh, so with that, on behalf of Everfi, um, and certainly Elena, um, if you can uh, bring us to a close as well from your perspective. I just think what a privilege it is to work in this space with everyone here, and I just am so honored to be a part of the partnership that we have here um, with Everfi. I think that to go back to that 408 people who we were able to serve and really connecting that prevention and response efforts, I'm just so proud of the work that we're doing, and thank you all for your hard work as well. Wonderful. Thank you all so much, and I uh, hope that you have a really productive and effective rest of October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you for all of your great work. Take care.